All right, guys. Well, what a day it has been in the collapse of global industrial civilization. Good Lord. As the bomb cyclone uh, <laughs> roars through the Finger Lakes of New York. So uh, somehow Bugs in a Jar Farm uh, is only a few feet underwater. But somehow the house is floating like the boat that it is. So what? I have I have survived a bomb cyclone and coming this close to killing me and the little dog hydroplaning and having a head-on collision on wet highways and good God. What a day. So it's almost relaxing to sit here and bring you today's Chronicle of the Collapse for Tuesday, October 26th. What a day. Uh, so anyway, I just uh, realized I never had a Sunday sermon this week. I was so busy building this flood control channel, which got put to the test and survived the flood control channel. Did... Uh, <laughs> did come through in a pinch, so I totally spaced out my Sunday sermon, and I want to thank Alert listener Mark Farmer for recommending, what are we, two, two days late on our sermon. I haven't checked in with our old buddy Richard Heinberg. Uh, Richard Heinberg used to be a lot more visible here in the Doomosphere. He's, maybe he's semi-retired, but he has a brand new essay on this excellent website called Resilience. I have uh, mentioned Resilience and other sermons. So what is on Richard Heinberg's? He's going to give us a history lesson about why we are so doomed. <clears throat> and with the title, this is a little bit... Uh, technical for Richard's usually more approachable writing, but uh, I think you can understand the big words. He titled his essay, Evolution and Climate Change Through the Lens of Power. This essay is based on and partly extracted from uh, Richard's book titled Power, Limits and Prospects for Human survival. So this is a taste of that book if you want to run out there. I'm sure you can find it on Amazon and all the usual places. I'm going to put the link on here, guys. You can go read this yourself, but if you want to go just listen to a, uh, a flood survivor read it for you, I'll be happy to wind down with some uh, reading here. Okay, take it away, Richard Heinberg. <clears throat> Tell us how we got to where we are. During the last century, evolutionary biologists developed the idea that power, defined as the rate of energy transfer, is key to the survival and success of species. This notion was formalized as the maximum power principle, which I've actually talked about here before, the maximum power principle which biologist John DeLong has explained as follows. Biological systems organize to increase power whenever the system constraints allow. With greater power, there is greater opportunity to allocate energy to reproduction and survival and therefore, an organism that captures and utilizes more energy than another organism in a population will have a fitness advantage. Yep. The 20th, this is going back to Richard now, the 20th century seemed a propitious time for, for such an idea to arise as one species, ours was in the process of gaining unprecedented power by harnessing the energy of fossil fuels. Coal, oil, and natural gas constitute tens of millions of years worth of stored ancient sunlight, 
energy that is vastly greater in quantity than any energy sources humans had ever harnessed previously. Yep, yep, yep. Constraints on all sorts of human activities were suddenly lifted. Soon we were out competing all other organisms and, in effect, taking over the world. During the last two centuries, human per capita energy usage grew eightfold, while the number of capitas also doubled three times over. All this newly available energy found uses in agriculture, mining, manufacturing, transportation, and of course, warfare. Today, just through mining, we displace far more of the planet's crust, crust each year than do all of nature's processes, wind, rain, and earthquakes combined. Human-made stuff now outweighs all of Earth's biomass. It has been the biggest power grab on this little planet of ours in tens of hundreds of millions of years. And here we are today at the top of the evolutionary heap, wielding extraordinary levels of control over the Earth, over other creatures, and over one another. We even have a name for this new era of human super empowerment, the Anthropocene. But as the side effects of human empowerment via fossil fuels have become more evident, the maximum power principle has turned into a seriously depressing idea to many ecologists, climate change, species extinctions, resource depletion, and air and water pollution are all evidence of increasing human impact all the, on the planet and all are side effects of the human power grab. <clears throat> there are technical workarounds for some of these problems such as replacing dangerous industrial chemicals with ones that are less so, but overall, real solutions would require cutting back on our power, reducing energy usage, reducing land use, reducing our extraction of natural resources, and reducing our pop you lation thank you richard heinberg once again reducing the population is the quickest way to reduce all of the other things in the need to reduce list for every human that is not born there will be no need to reduce anything else that that human is going to cause. Anyway, I do get uh, away with my... Anyway, back to Richard. <clears throat> However, if the maximum power principle is inviolable, then cutting back may not be possible. Hmm. We would have to go against our evolutionary imperative. And that is what is depressing. We humans may not be capable of anticipating natural limits and pre-adapting to them. Instead, we may be designed by evolution itself to overshoot natural limits and then crash land with almost inconceivable levels of destruction to the natural world and to humanity itself. Sure enough, 
policy makers, I love that word, policy makers, for decades have looked askance at suggestions from ecologists for downsizing the economy or limiting energy usage and, of course, population growth. Indeed, the requirement for growth has been baked into the structure of modern societies. Today, employment levels, investment returns, company profits, and government tax revenues all depend on continued economic expansion. Big environmental organizations, which used to call on society to reduce, reuse, and recycle, have largely given up on that message. Instead, they now call for green growth through renewable energy, hoping this message will be more palatable. Unfortunately, several key studies suggest that the prospects for decoupling economic growth from increased rates of energy usage and for green growth in general are not good. We can exchange some of our polluting technologies and processes for more benign ones, but as long as population and total consumption levels continue to grow, we are locked in to a paradigm that is utterly at odds with nature's limits and balances. Resources will deplete, wastes will accumulate, and other species will be crowded out of existence. Still, the idea that we are slaves to the passion for power is debatable. In power, limits and prospects for human survival, I argue that evolution has found ways of preventing species from attaining so much power that they overrun environmental limits. Similarly, human societies have evolved ways of reining in bullies, <clears throat> sharing and conserving resources, and limiting inequality. Huh. Apparently, I am completely unaware of, of the human societies Richard is talking about. I have never heard of one single human society that's been able to do any of those, but uh, Richard Heinberg is a much more learned man than I, and, and I detect some hopium creeping into this essay. I propose a new biosocial principle in evolution, the optimum power principle to describe these pathways towards moderation. It's not an alternative to the maximum power principle, merely an informal addendum. Examples of the optimism, the optimum power principle at work in nature and human affairs are abundant, starting with a protein in living cells that senses whether there are sufficient resources and space for expansion and directs cells either to grow or retain certain size and engage in cleaning and repair activities. Homeostasis, which maintains a health, healthy power balance within individual cells and whole multi-celled organisms, organisms is an example of what systems theorists call balancing or self-limiting feedback. Ecosystems are subject to balancing feedbacks that often take the form of predator-prey population dynamics and many organisms <clears throat> such as the American pika have seemingly made the choice to specialize on rare foods or harsh environments, thereby limiting their own numbers 
while in return gaining relatively relative population stability, humans have a long history of pursuing optimum rather than maximum power. In hunter-gatherer communities, nearly everything was shared. Bullies were eliminated through ostracism or capital punishment. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into a rant about uh, uh, noble savages uh, have no problem with capital punishment. They, these noble savages, they wouldn't put up with this crap. They wouldn't put up with this crap that we put up with as a society. These guys would be hanging from trees. Anyway, I'm getting off on my on a capital punishment rant. I need to be very careful. Good for the noble savages uh, being in favor of capital punishment. And so there was little opportunity for the development of extreme inequality of any kind. Children were taught to be humble and self-effacing so as to maintain solidarity within the group. Anthropologist Richard Lee, who studied the Kuhn people of Southern Africa, noted that when a hunter brought back a prized animal to share with the band, he always talked about how skinny and worthless it was. If he failed to do so, others would complain about the meat and make fun of him. Uh, anyway, this is getting a little bit weird. Uh, so guys, good lord, Richard is in a mood. Uh, so, uh, good lord, guys, anyway, apparently this excerpt of his new book is the new book. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to give you the link and you can take, you can read the, I'm about one third of the way through this. Uh, Okay, let's get down uh, towards the bottom of this. I'm, I'm skipping. If you want to read all the middle half, you will have to go read this yourself. Okay, what is the bottom line of this uh, essay? However, we can be fairly confident that one way or another, human power will be reined in through some combination of collective moral struggle on one hand and on the other hand social ecological unraveling triggered by climate change, biodiversity loss, resource depletion, economic collapse, political polarization, famine, population decline, don't forget pandemic taking, that's 0.03% of pandemic. Social fragmentation and war. Okay, so we have collective moral struggle on this hand and that list on this hand. Uh, which hand is the smart money on? Anyway. You can uh, place your own bet on where the smart money is. Uh, the actual trajectory of future events will be determined by how much collective self-limitation humanity can muster, what quantity of carbon emissions we are able to forego, how many weapons we dismantle, how successful we are at taxing the wealthy. Yes. Can campaigners forge durable alliances? Can they communicate effectively with the public and take strategic advantage of opportunities? Or will self-consuming capitalism win the day? In the best instance, we humans will learn collectively and rapidly to live equitably and peacefully within limits to a much greater degree than we do now. In the worst, society will uncontrollably 
descend the ladder of cultural evolution back to a condition that can be sustained with whatever resources are left in the aftermath of a social unraveling our surviving descendants learning from hard experience might eventually adopt uh, yeah right adopt cultural narrative similar to ones that indigenous peoples used in order to protect biodiversity and to keep human population within the carrying capacity of the environment. And what he's talking about here is the I word, infanticide. And if you don't know what the cultural practice of the noble savage, uh, along with capital punishment, uh, look up the word infanticide. And you will find uh, one of the ways the noble savages uh, kept their population uh, in check. <clears throat> Ironically, these narratives might closely resemble those we would need to develop now if we are to minimize the unraveling. I don't know if Richard Heinberg is promoting infanticide or not. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> those narratives would likely encode a deep cultural skepticism of power in all its forms and a profound reinforcement for habits of self-restraint and self-control. We cannot do away with power, nor should we. It is necessitated by the fact that we are organisms, and especially since we are big-bodied, linguistic, tool-making mammals. But if we wish to avoid outcomes that are awful to contemplate and far worse to experience, we can and must rein in the extreme powers that currently threaten our success and even our survival. If we are truly smart, we can do so in ways that are beautiful and that make our descendants happy for a long time to come. Yes. Anyway, uh, we shall see. Uh, you know where my bet is, and it ain't on self-control. Uh, anyway, I need to wrap this up and go pour another margarita to recover from uh, the bomb cyclone and hope to hell that the rain is stopping and that we have dodged another bullet. We shall see what tomorrow brings. Bye, guys. Say goodbye, Sancho Villa.